Good morning, everyone. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, great, thanks. Um, good morning, I hope you're enjoying the conference thus far. Uh, we already had one contributed session earlier today, and now we move on to our second keynote speech that will be delivered by Professor Rachel Griffith of the University of Manchester and the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Allow me to say a couple of things as a way of introducing uh, Rachel. Um, Rachel has made significant contributions with her research in a broad area of subjects within economics. And this includes taxation, innovation, productivity, and more recently, nutrition and the food retail sector, or the retail food sector. But across these subjects, although they may not seem like they're related to each other, there is a common denominator in, in Rachel's research. Across these subjects, she tries to examine what is the relationship between government policy and economic performance. So her, rese her research is very much policy-oriented, policy-driven. She has been the recipient of numerous research grants from various uh, funding bodies, such as the ESRC, the European Research Council, the European Commission, and the Treasury, to name just a few. In terms of her professional activities, she has been a fellow of the British Academy. This year, she's acting as the president-elect of the European Economic Association. Next year, she will be the president of the European Economic Association. And since 2011, she has been the joint managing editor of the Economics Journal. More recently, actually about a month ago, it has been announced by the European Economic Association that Rachel is for this year the recipient of the prestigious Birgit Grodel Award that is awarded to a European-based female economist who has made a significant contribution to the economics profession. The award is bestowed every other year and Rachel is only the second recipient. Her talk today will dwell on the do's and don'ts of the publication process, and I think that will be of interest to most of the PhD students. And her talk, I presume, will be mainly uh, drawing from her experience as a journal editor. Now, before inviting Rachel on the stage, and I hope I will not embarrass her, I would like to wish to her happy birthday, given that today is her birthday. Rachel, the floor is yours. of my experience as a journal editor and as an author. And I'm going to emphasize that me, as well as everyone else who you ever talk to in the profession, has had loads and loads of papers rejected from journals. And so much I'm going to talk about is my experience of having papers rejected from journals. In the aim that that makes you feel better when you get rejected. <laughs> okay, so what's the session about? So this is a super practical session. It's nothing to do with my research at all. It's really because as I've talked to PhD students over the years, I've realized that um, there's a lot about the publication process, which is really central to our profession, which people coming out of a PhD don't know very much about, and why would you know much about it, right? So this is really just kind of trying to talk a bit about why, what, what, how the publication process works, why we do it, and how to kind of try and use it constructively throughout your career. So um, I'm... So, so in talking about this, the kind of completely most important thing is that you do good, interesting, solid research. I'm not going to talk about how to do that. This is not at all about your research. I'm going to talk about, given the research you have of whatever quality it is, how can you make the most of it? How can you get it best published? How can you take it forward most constructively? Okay. So I'm taking as given the research quality and then just talking about the publication process. So this is really meant to be like useful to you. So I'm very, very happy to take questions as we go along. I'll leave time at the end for questions as well. But if I say something and you have a question about it, please just raise your hand and we can stop and talk about it as we go along. So the first thing I want to talk about is like, why do we publish? Why is, publica why is publication so central to what we do and so central to the profession? So I think there's kind of three bits, that three, three aspects of it that I would want to emphasize. One is that 
the peer review process itself is a very constructive process. It helps you learn about your work, learn what the profession thinks about your work, and if you're reflective during that process, what you yourself think about your work. And I think when I look back over the times when I've had what felt like very painful peer review processes of my work, I've ended up coming out with much better quality work and a much better perspective on what's interesting and important about my work. And so that's kind of one of the things I want to emphasize is how to use what can sometimes be a rather traumatic process to constructively and usefully and to kind of improve the quality of your research. So I think that's really one important thing that publication does. It also, probably more obviously, vets papers for other people. So there's a lot of papers out there, and so as a consumer of papers, how do I know which ones to read, which ones I want to pay the most attention to? Well, the ones that are in the best journals are ones that at least some subset of the profession has decided they think are really the most important papers. So it helps readers understand which papers they should read and pay most attention to. And probably, again, most importantly, and at the top of people's mind, is it's the way that we make promotion and funding decisions in economics. So where you publish and how well published you are is really probably the most key thing, particularly in places like Britain, where we have like the research excellence framework and other types of um, tenure dis promotion decisions are largely based on your publication record. Okay, so what I want to talk through first is just the mechanics of how publication process works. So many of you will know a lot about this, but I've found that many people don't. So I want to try and dispel some myths. Then I want to talk a little bit about uh, the process of getting your paper ready to submit. So given that you have a, what you think is a finished piece of work, what are some of the final things that you need to do before you submit it that are really important to uh, helping get it published? And then just a few words about how to make the process all nicer and more constructive. Okay, so first of all, just the mechanics of it. So I'll go through this quickly, but do stop if anything's unclear. Stop me. So you have a piece of work that you've finished and you want to try to get it published. So what do you do? First of all, you send it to one journal. And uh, so you select the journal. You need to send it to one journal at a time. You should never send a paper to more than one journal. So then what happens when the paper lands on the editor's desk? Editors have an initial skim read of the paper. That normally means they may spend something like between 15 minutes and an hour, depending on how familiar they are with the topic, and take a decision about whether to screen or desk reject, i.e. send it back to immediately, say it's not suitable for publication, or to send it out to referees. Um, and I'm going to come back to talk more about the screen reject process in a second. If the paper is sent to referees, it'll go to something between one and four referees, depending on the journal and the expertise of the editor. If your paper's in a field that the editor works in themselves, they may feel happy having fewer referees. Um, if it's something that's farther away from their own expertise, then they may ask more referees. Um, referees take between one and six months to return their review. Editors take between one and disgracefully five months or even longer to reach a decision. So it can be, you know, between the best case three months, the worst case two years until you get a decision on your paper. And the decision will be either to reject the paper, to ask you for a revise and resubmit, so you, you, the paper will be considered again once you've made some revisions, accept with revisions, which is basically accept, or just accept as it is. It's very unusual to get accept as it is, but that does happen. So what criteria is the editor going to use in taking that decision? So partly that's going to depend on the journal. Top journals are going to require more fundamental contributions and of broader interest. So to get into one of the top journals, your paper really needs to be making some sort of key fundamental contribution that needs to be really of interest to anyone in the economics profession. In a field journal, it would be really making some kind of pretty important contribution, but it could be in a more specific area. Um, and as you kind of go down the ranking of journals, you, the contribution would need to be less. So they'll, they'll um, think about the novelty of your contribution, the importance of the research question. So is it a really big topic that everyone's interested in, or is it a very narrow topic that only a few people in economics are interested in? How does, the, how does that topic compare to the people who read the journal? Is it of interest to you know, an American audience versus an international audience, if it's a field audience versus a general audience. And then how clearly presented and well organized the paper is. And one of the things I want to emphasize 
is that clarity of presentation and well organization is something, good organization is something that people, in my experience, don't pay enough attention to. And then you can have a superb piece of work, but if you don't write it and sell it well, the audience will, the readership will not know what you're talking about. And that's something that a lot of people who have very good pieces of research fall down on. Um, and so you, you know, want to make sure that, uh, again, I'll, I'll emphasize that more, that your argumentation is logical and dispassionate and academic. Okay, so screen rejects are one of the things that I find in talking to people, particularly young people, that people have the most pre -con incorrect preconceptions about. So screen reject means that the editor rejects your paper without asking anyone else, or at some journals they might ask an associate editor for just like a small paragraph. So people get very upset sometimes when their paper gets screen rejected. But really, what, let me explain a little bit about why editors do it and how I think you should see the process. So one, it's usually done very quickly. And at most at top journals, so I know the exact statistics for the economic journal, the Review of Economic Statistics, and the Journal of the European Economic Association. At all of those journals, something like 50% of submissions are screen rejected. Right, so a lot of papers are screen rejected. Why is that? One reason is because it would be impossible to run those journals without screen rejecting that number. So for example, here I have a figure from the EJ last year. We received 1,115 submissions, of which we have room to publish about 5%. So there's no way that six editors can handle that number of papers. We have about approximately well, close to 200, 189 papers each, each year. We can't deal with all of those completely and get referees for it. So, we, so it's, an, it's really, a, to a large extent, about efficiency and about um, the fact that if we didn't do that, papers would be sitting around for a long time. So from your point of view as a submitter, what you get out of the process is a very quick decision and you can move on. From the editor's point of view, what they're going to think about is, um, is the, you know, so what I do when I look at a paper is I'll read the first couple pages and I'll say, imagine the authors did everything that they said they're doing perfectly. Would I think that this paper makes a significant contribution and would I be interested in publishing it in the journal? And if the answer to that is no, then there's not really any point in me making the author wait for three to six months to get that decision from me. I can take that decision straight away and say, you're really better off going to a field journal because the contribution that you're making is, is not going to get you into the, to the EJ. Um, and that's the same kind of idea. You know, sometimes, uh, or, or sometimes editors would also look at some of the detail if it's in their area and if they kind of can quickly take a decision that they don't believe the identification strategy or something, they may also screen reject on that basis. But I don't think, you, what you really shouldn't see the screen rejection process as either unfair or as a complete failure. It's about efficiency. And in a way, I would say to people, if you don't ever get screen, screen rejected, you're not aiming high enough. You know, you should aim to get screen rejected occasionally. Not all the time. If every time you submit you're getting screen rejected, then you're deluded and you need to get a grip on reality. But if you occasionally get screen rejected, that's good. You're sort of aiming a little bit higher than you, but then you find out where, where your work is, you know, what, what level your work is going to be published at. So you should be occasionally getting screen rejected. So what I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about really is how you can minimize the chance of getting screen rejected though, <laughs> by at least getting the, author, getting the editor interested in the first couple pages. Given, you know, given the work you've done. So selling your idea is super important. And one of the things I think you see, particularly with young people's papers, is that they fail to do well, is to really clearly and succinctly, in the introduction, state what contribution you're making to the literature. So why would I want to publish your paper? Beca I want to publish your paper because I believe that when I read, you know, I, I want to publish papers that when readers of the journal read it, they learn something new. They read the paper and they walk away saying, I didn't know that before. That's interesting. I'm glad I know that now. Before I read that paper, I didn't think about that thing in the world and now I can, now I think of the world in a slightly different way. So, so what you want to do very early on in your paper is make a very clear statement. I personally am of the Ernest Hemingway school of thought and writing. Just say it in a short sentence. You know, our contribution in this paper is X. And that sentence can often be super difficult to write. 
and sort of, you know, that's another thing I want to emphasize and I'll say repeatedly, I've had papers where it's taken me months to get that sentence right. So, you know, being really, you have to have a good understanding of the literature, you have to have a good understanding about what your paper really says and how it relates to the literature to write that sentence well. So that sentence, it's often a sentence that you would, when you start working on a paper, you might write it one way, but by the time you've finished, you've sort of figured out that you're actually showing something different than you set out. Research is an uncertain process. And so don't be afraid to change that. Don't be afraid, don't keep the contribution, the beginning of your paper, the same as when you started out, the, the started to write this. Because as you go along, you may well end up looking in different directions or find that you're showing something different than you set out to show. So the other thing is to make the introduction clear and to the point. You don't need some huge, long, comprehensive list of every paper that's ever been written in the field. Discuss the literature as it relates to your paper. Explain how your paper adds to that literature. But you don't need to say what every other paper did or how, you know, discuss it in great detail. Um, and, and you read, you know, the first couple pages really just need to be super well written because that's the first thing people are going to see and that's what's going to draw people in to the paper. So here's just two quick examples I wanted to show to, to illustrate what I mean. So here's a paper, this, this is, I'm going to show you two papers and this is the first paragraph of the paper in both cases. So this is a paper in the American Economic Review and so they spend uh, three sentences giving a motivation for why the welfare effects of bundling and multi-channel television markets is an interesting topic. And then the last sentence of the paragraph says very clearly what this paper adds to the literature. So as an editor, I can read that paragraph and I can decide whether I think that's an interesting topic and whether I think that a paper that did that successfully would make a substantial contribution to the literature. Straight away, as a reader, I know where I am. I know what the paper's about. I know what I'm expecting it to show me. Another paper from Econometrica that's you know, so, so one might think, oh, that's easy to do in a very applied, very policy-focused paper, but here's a really not applied, not policy-focused paper, um, which also just the second sentence, in this paper, this is what we do. So if you look at papers in top journals, you'll see that they often have that kind of statement, not always in the first paragraph, sometimes in the second, third paragraph, but almost always in the first two pages. Whereas I often get papers uh, submitted that, you know, you have to go to page seven before there's our contribution. And there's this long story that's kind of the thought process of how I got here. You know, when I was born, my mother suggested this was true, and then I thought about it for 10 years, and then I had to spend seven years constructing standard errors, and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it's just, you know, just cut all that out, get to the point. So make sure your contribution's clear. I've said that now on five slides, I think, but it's really important. Um, and when you get a paper back or when someone makes a comment on it and they say that it's not clear to me what you're saying or it's not clear to me what you're doing, I've often got comments back from uh, saying, but I said that in footnote 26 on page 37, you know, didn't the, and it, didn't the referee read that? You know, it was clear in my appendix C of the paper that that's what I did. No, you, you know, it's your, if, if, if people, if anyone says to you they don't understand what you're doing or if people repeatedly say they don't understand what you're doing, it's your fault, not theirs. So you may think that you've said it, but clearly they're not getting the message. And so you should go back and reflect on how you're saying it. It's true, sometimes referees read things a bit quickly, but that's how readers are going to read it too. You know, and when you're giving a talk, if people ask questions and they're, you, you think, oh, I told you that, but they clearly, you know, there's just several people who don't understand what you said, then think about how to say it differently. So it's, it's your job as the author to say it in a way that they understand. Um, also, writing economics is not like a murder mystery or a joke. Don't leave the punchline to the end. Readers don't want to go through the whole paper not knowing what the point is and just be told at the end. Just say it at the beginning. This is what we look at. This is what we find. No suspense about it. Um, so, okay, so be succinct. Don't clutter up the paper and throw in the kitchen sink. Again, people have tended, particularly this is true in empirical papers, but also in theory papers. People tend to want to put in things that they spent a long time on, or here's some other, you know, here's my main result, but here's 10 other results that I got along the way. If you need to, put them in an appendix, but, you know, stick to your main message. A paper should have a message, write that message. If you have other messages, write another paper. 
but have, you know, a paper should have a point, make that point in that paper, and keep to that point, keep it. Um, write it well, it's just annoying to read papers that have grammatical errors and typos. If you can't be bothered to go through them, why should I be bothered to read it? You know, especially if you're not a native English speaker, get other people to help you with that and, and make sure that the grammar is correct, but it's just, you know, I've seen people with typos in the title or typos in the first line of the abstract. It's like if you haven't, if you can't be bothered to get that right, then that doesn't give me very much, um, you know, confidence in the fact that you've done everything else in the paper right. Um, and just more to the point, if the editors and referees enjoy reading the paper, you, you know, they're going to be in a good mood, they're going to be more likely to like the paper. So often you get comments back like, I really enjoyed reading this paper, it was fun to read. Is easy, you know, I enjoyed it, I understood what it was saying, it was nice. They're going to be more favorably inclined. Okay, so when you think about submitting to a journal, how do you decide what journal you should uh, submit to? So you should aim high. You're definitely not going to get published in a good journal if you don't submit to a good journal. So try to aim high. But be realistic, because it's just going to waste everyone's time if you have, you know, some very minor paper and you submit it to Econometrica. Um, but so how do you actually decide wh where it should go? That, that's not always that easy. And in fact, what, when you decide where you're going to submit a paper, you may often want to rewrite the paper with that journal in mind. Journals have different styles. And so once you decide where you're going to submit, you should look at the papers in that journal and see if you, you know, if, if your paper's in that style. But one of the best ways, I think, is to look at what papers you reference. So if the literature that you're placing your paper in is in field journals, it's unlikely that your paper, the contribution of your paper, is going to be suitable for a top journal. It could be if it's so fundamental that you're showing something new that no one's ever written about, that's possible. But if what you're saying is, I'm building on this paper and this paper, which were published in field journals, your paper probably belongs in those field journals. Whereas if you're building on papers that were published in top journals, that those journals are probably the journals that your paper would be most likely to be suitable for. Um, but look at the journal. Make sure you look at the last couple years of the journal and reference any papers that have been published in that journal recently that are on the field top topic that you're writing. But look at the papers and see you know, if that looks like the kind of thing, if you think the editors and the associate editors are going to be interested in what you're doing. You know, editors are dictators in this market, right? So editors have fixed terms. And so to some extent, editors try and be objective, but mainly editors choose papers that they like. And that's their job and people do it for a fixed term and then new people come in. And so, you know, who the editor is is quite important. Understanding what their interests are. If you're going to submit to a journal, find out who the editors are. Try and present in front of them. If they're going to come to your department or if you can go to their department, ask them about what do you think of this paper. You know, find out what they think. Read their work, see what they're interested in. Um, Okay, so, so what are the journals? Uh, so the top, there's a, economics, unlike other professions, we have a really clear consensus on the top five. So the top five journals are Econometric, AER, QJ, JP, and Restud. Everyone agrees that, you know, a, a paper in one of those can kind of make a career. Two or three papers will get you a chair in many departments. So those are, you know, the top places to go if you can get in those, fantastic. Um, the second kind of tier, there's a second tier of general interest journals, which is where like the economic journal fits the um, GL, those journals, and then there's top field journals, which are also very good, and then there's like 10,000 other journals. So these lists aren't entirely comprehensive, but they're kind of a rough idea of what to think about the rating of journals. There's a bunch of really good online, so the EJ recently, in anticipation of the REF, had a couple papers that talked about journal rankings and give some nice tables of journal rankings. So if you're interested in looking at um, for example, for the ref, what the likely, the average ref score of a paper in a journal is, you can see there's, a, there's a, some articles that show that. In economics, books and other forms of publications are much less prestigious than in other disciplines. Okay, so before you submit, it's really important that you don't just kind of sit in your office and write a paper and not talk to anyone about it. Learn what the profession thinks about your work, who's interested in what you're writing about, talk to colleagues about um, what, you're, what you're working on and see if they find it interesting. Find out what is it about your paper that people find the most interesting. Sometimes you think one result is the most interesting result, but actually other people think a different result is interesting. 
or it may be then in a kind of related area of research that you're not so aware of, your result is very important. And you can kind of place your work in a slightly different literature and that may make it more or less interesting to different groups of people. It's super important to present your paper. Presenting your paper is to a large extent about figuring out how to sell it. So when I'm trying to write up a paper, I'll often try and present it so that I can try out a storyline, try out the first, the way I would write the introduction and see how people react. Do people seem interested in it or do they seem bored? If they seem bored, then try a different storyline or talk to people about it. Meet seminar speakers and visitors to your department and talk to them about it. Anyone, you know, anyone who comes to your department, ask to meet them and give them a little 10 minute presentation of your paper. You can hand them a copy of your paper. You can email people copies of your paper. Don't be offended if they don't respond, but it's fine to do that. Um, you can write to people and say, could I come to your department and present this paper? You know, they, again, don't be offended if they say, if they don't invite you, but you can ask, no one will mind. The other thing is listen to what people say. Don't try and defend your paper and argue. I mean, sometimes you want to defend your paper, but when you're trying to get comments back, if someone starts saying something about your paper, rather than arguing against them, try and listen to what they say and understand what kind of comment they're making to think about whether you can incorporate that in somehow. Even if you end up not really agreeing with it, you'll make them feel better. They might be a referee, you know, engage with them. See, you might get something good out of it. At the least, you won't make them cross. Um, it's always a really good idea to write down people's comments both when you're giving a presentation or when you're talking to them. So one, it just kind of gives you a little bit more time to answer their question. Uh, two, it may be that in the heat of giving the talk, you don't realize that actually they asked a really good question. And when you think about it later, if you've written it down, that you may find that actually it's a pretty relevant question and you just didn't understand that when they asked. But it also makes them feel good. So it's always good to say, oh, that's a really good question. I really wanted to think about that. And you know, so as well as in talks, as well as being a chance to present your work, someone said to me once, every talk is a job market talk. You know, in economics, there's a lot of movement around, and so you know, you never know who's in the audience and who's going to see you. So every talk's a job market talk. Every talk potentially has an editor in the audience. So always think about that. Always think about you know presenting your work and being open to people's comments and suggestions and talking to them and you know interacting. It's also useful. To, to get these first, this first paragraph to talk to people outside economics. Can you explain, so if it's like that econometric paper by Yap Abring, you might have trouble explaining it to your grandma, but if it's like Greg Crawford's paper that was about the television industry, you probably could. So it's useful to try and explain it to other people because that often makes you, you know, clear in your mind what it's really about. Try working on the very short, what we call tweet version of it. You know, what really is your paper about at, at its essence? Um, and if it's something super interesting, you should be able to convince your grandma that it's worth, worth getting published. Okay, so how do you deal with acceptance? Celebrate, drink champagne, have a good time, there you go. That's easy. How do you deal with revise and resubmit? So people often see revise and resubmit is not that good of a thing. It's brilliant, right? So a very small percentage of papers, the journals get revise and resubmit, and revise and resubmit means you know you're really substantially there. You, you've got a big chance of getting your paper published. It's yours to lose now. So celebrate. You've got a foot in the door. That's fantastic. It's not bad news at all. It's really super good news. Then you're going to open the referees reports and be super cross at everything they said and think they're total idiots and they've completely misunderstood you. And phew. so whatever you do, do not send an email to anyone at that point in time, especially not the editor. If you need to, send an email to your grandma or to yourself or whatever, just venting. But read it, walk away, have a nice weekend, go for a run, take a bath, whatever you need to do, chill out, get some perspective on what they've said. You know, often they're right, referees. Sometimes they're wrong, but more often than people think, they're making good comments. And kind of remember that these guys are doing it anonymously in their spare time with no compensation. So they're being super nice to you. You should just be so happy that some professional people decided that they would spend hours of their spare Sunday reading your paper and giving you comments. 
It's not, they're not being mean and nasty. They're not out to get you. They're being constructive and trying to, you know, improve your paper, basically. So see it in that light. Go through the comments and think of how lucky you are that these people made all these wonderful comments and make a plan how to respond. Inevitably, you'll disagree with some of them. But, what, but you need to take all of them into account and figure out kind of what you think about all of them in a totality. Sometimes referees will disagree with each other. A good editor will kind of adjudicate on that and tell you which things you should pay attention to and which you shouldn't. So pay a lot of attention to the editor's letter because the editor may well say, even if kind of subtly, you can ignore referee two because I don't agree with them. You should pay attention to referee three. You know, so read what the editor has said. Um, it's, it's very rarely a good idea to complain to the editor. There are some exceptions, but as an editor, it really is never a very good idea. So just grin and bear it. If you feel that you've been unfairly treated by referees, move on. You'll be fairly treated next time. Unless it's really some outrageous thing that they've done. So once you've chilled out and taken all your time to do that, so when you respond to a revise and resubmit, you should really respond very detailed. So basically, you've got your foot in the door. What you want to do is give the editor and the referees no chance of being able to say that you didn't respond to something they asked you to respond to. If they've asked you to do seven things and you do seven, those seven things, they can't really reject your paper. So that's what I mean is you're kind of there. It's yours to lose at that point. If you can convincingly say, I've done these things, it's very unusual that someone would then say, oh, well, I'm going to reject it anyway. That has occasionally happened, but it's very unusual. So you should draft a super detailed response that explains exactly how you've dealt with every point. If there's a point that you don't agree with and you haven't dealt with, try to respond, not by saying, the referee is an idiot, this is not true, but respond by saying, this is a really interesting point, and we've reflected on the way that we write the paper, and we've tried to redraft the paper to take account of that. You know, so it's just, you can almost always put a negative thing with a positive spin. And, it, and if you try and argue with the referee, you're probably going to lose. So the more you can not argue with the referee, that doesn't mean you have to do exactly everything that they've said if you think it's not a sensible thing, but you should do something in response. So you should say, we were, you know, this is a great point, we've reflected on it, the referee suggests we do X, we've thought about it and we think actually doing Y really addresses this point in, a, in a, an appropriate manner, and so we've done Y. You know, so, so you can turn it around to do something that you think is a, is a more sensible thing to do, but always try and say it in a positive way rather than a negative way. Emphasize how much you've changed the paper, and so just make it really difficult for them to say that you haven't addressed any of their points or haven't taken them seriously. So I personally, as an editor, like it when people send me back something that has, you know, copied the referee's comments in italics and then given their response. Because that means I can just look at the, the response and I don't even have to go back to the paper if I don't want to. And I can evaluate how I think they've responded to the point. So it just makes my job easier. Make, and, the ed, and then I'll send that to the referees and they can do the same thing. So anything you can do to make my life easier the better for me, right? The more happy I'm going to be and the easier I'm going to be able to take a decision. But um, and don't be afraid of having the response be really long. So in many papers where I've got revised issues, I've sent back like something that was almost as long as the paper by way of response. So 25, 30 pages that will have, you know, I'll say, well, the referees asked for this. We've put this in the paper, but here's three other versions of that robustness check just to reassure you. So we're not going to put that in the paper, but just to reassure the referee that this is what's going on. If you're doing that, sometimes you might want to summarize for the editor just in one page the main changes you've made, but then provide a whole bunch of other information. And then again, then the referee gets that and it's really difficult for them to say, look, they haven't taken this point seriously or they haven't dealt with this point. So you, you know, a, a revisory submit can be a lot of work, but in my, again, in my experience, it's made my papers way better. Right? So this is usually a constructive process, and you get a better paper out of it. So, so, you, you know, so use it as such. So how should you deal with reject? Don't freak out. Everyone gets rejected. I think probably of all the papers I've ever submitted, over 50% the first decision has been a rejection. So everyone gets rejected. Nobel Prize winners, everyone gets rejected. So what do you do when you get a reject? You should do more or less the same thing as a revise and resubmit. 
you're just going to send it to another journal next time. So read through the reports, put them down, walk away. You'll probably be more cross than the revise and resubmit because you've been rejected. But you know, don't email immediately back to the editor complaining that this is unfair. If, read it, think about it. If you really still think it's unfair, then you can. But, but wait a couple of days and talk to other people about it to make sure that you're not just being silly. But before you resubmit, I mean, depending on the kind of comments you got on the referees' reports, um, if before you resubmit, think about what the referees have said, because it happens a lot that you go back to the same referees. So it's very common that if a paper's been in another journal and then it comes say, to the EJ and I send it to someone, that person says, oh, I've already refereed this paper. And if you send them back the same paper with no changes, they're just going to say reject again and they're going to be a bit annoyed. So you, um, you want to at least try and reflect some of the things they've said and, and um, so that when they see it, they can see that you've made some changes and so they'll consider it again. Um, or they'll at least say to the editor, I've seen this paper before, but they have revised it. So you, know, you might want to consider that. So some journals, like the EJ, actually invite authors to submit past reports and a response to those reports. So literally, you can treat, if you, put, if you submit your paper to the AER and you get rejected, but you get a very positive rejection, like a, this paper is quite nice, but just not quite good enough, and you revise it, you could send those referees' reports and your response to them as if you'd got a revise and resubmit into the EJ. The benefit to you of that is that like, we deal with it quicker, and other journals offer some, some other journals offer that too. It's not always a good thing to do. You can also get rejected really much quicker. That could be a good thing. If you're going to get rejected, you may as well get rejected quickly. Um, but it's something to consider. So it's not always a good idea to tell the editor the whole history of the paper, but it is sometimes, particularly if you can put a positive spin on it and talk about how you revised the paper. Um, you know, editors usually find out the history, and it's kind of better if it comes from you and you can tell it in your way rather than they discover it from someone else. But that's something really to consider in each case individually. So, so finally, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, seeing the publication process as part of your career development rather than a discrete thing in itself that's kind of an annoyance. You know, I have to get this paper published and so this is just some annoying thing I have to do is really, you know, it's part of what you're doing. It's part of research. It's part of learning about what your research, what, where your research fits in the literature and what it contributes and where it's going. And so reading referees reports and giving talks and you know, they're all kind of part of the same thing of really seeing you know, peer review of understanding what other people think and understanding how your work fits into that process. So it, it allows you to learn about the strengths and weaknesses of your work and about, um, you know, uh, about what other people are doing. If you get good comments like, well, referees are generally anonymous, so you don't know who they are, but in, in talks and in the audience, if, you know, if people are interested in your work and talk to you, but go and talk to them more about it. They may, I've had you know, co-authors have ended up out of that relationship. Someone asked me a good question in a, in a conference and then I'll go and talk to them and they'll end up find, discovering that there's some mutual interest and that can lead to some new research idea. So it's, you know, it's, it's all about the same thing of moving, your, just, just you know, discovering what, what topics are of interest and how they fit into things. Um, and comments from referees, can often, you know, in the process of revising a paper, they may ask you to do some things that you may think, oh, that's actually an interesting second paper I could write. It doesn't fit within this paper, but that's an interesting way to take this work forward, and you could write a follow-up paper. So, you know, be open to those ideas. Don't, don't, be, don't feel like you're fighting against other people to get your work done. You know, it's really about collaboratively people trying to move forward the frontier of research. Um, so, so treat the process as a learning process, use it constructively, think about how lovely referees and editors are to spend all this time, and really don't get disheartened. I think people are often think, you know, oh, people who are successful, their papers just get accepted all the time. So one of the things I often hear young people say is, oh, it's because I'm a young person and the editor just rejected my paper because they don't know who I am. That's so untrue. In most journals, young people get the benefit of the doubt. Certainly at the EJ and the review, that's like a really explicit editorial objective is to facilitate young people publishing. So someone who submits and, and where we know that they you know, don't have tenure yet will both deal with their paper quickly 
and we'll, try, we'll kind of, you know, if it's not perfectly written, we'll try to give them a second chance to work on the paper and make it better. Whereas if a senior person submits something that's not well argued and not well executed, they should know better and why are they wasting my time and so I'm not going to bother being so lenient to them. So it's, you know, actually young people are in most journals given more of the benefit of the doubt. Um, so, but, but nonetheless, you know, everyone gets rejected a lot. Um, that's, that's the way the process works. And so don't get disheartened by that. You know, people are rejecting your paper, not you. So don't take it personally. It's your paper. But it is depressing. I hate being rejected. You feel depressed the next day. So you got to learn to live with it and have a thick skin. And, you know, that's life. That's the, that's the profession. And so you need to learn how to use it constructively, not destructively. So that was what I had to say. But please ask questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rachel. Do we have questions from the audience? Michaela? Hi. Uh, Richard, uh, I was thinking when you said that uh, some journals, like the Economic Journal, are allowed to send uh, referee reports from previous submissions. Mm -hmm. How informative are these reports from you as an, as an editor, given that you don't know who wrote them? So, or can you get in touch with the editor that handled it the first time and ask who wrote these reports? Do you do these sort of things? Yeah, it's heterogeneous. So, um, so for some journals, you, so you don't know who they are when they're submitted. There are some journals where we've had agreements with the editors where, uh, so, so currently we have an agreement with the editors of the um, TJE and the uh, Restud that if they have a paper that they feel is very good but just doesn't get in, they'll actually suggest to the author in the response that they could send it to us and then they'll write to us as well. And so in that case, with the permission, of the, uh, we, we could find out who the, who the referees are. But even if we don't know who they are, if they were refereeing for a top journal, I would be pretty confident in, in just taking the, the referee's report at face value. So often we would take, like, imagine that you submit a paper and you submit three referees reports from the AER. I may sometimes send the whole package to one more referee. Say, here's, here, here's my reading of this. I wouldn't mind having another opinion. What do you think? So you don't, you don't need to write a whole new referees report, but just read through the whole thing. And, then, and I know who that person is, and so then I can, use, you know, I can talk to them and go back and forth on it. But um, I personally find it super useful, and I've had really particularly, I mean, I think of the, when the, when the papers have been rejected from top five journals, the success rate is pretty high, at the EJ at least. I'd say over 50% of them end up getting published. Um, when the referees' reports are from a field journal, that's not the case. And so sometimes people submit to a much less good journal and then send us the referees' reports. Really? <laughs> That's not going to work. Um, but, you know, and the, edit and the, and the letter from the um, editor can also be very informative, saying, well, you know, they've, all these people have gone through and evaluated it and given you a pretty clear view of where the paper stands, and then you can take your own judgment. But I, I found that that's a, a really efficient and super, uh, super good way to deal with repeated. But, but it's not a good idea if you can't deal with the referee's reports or if they're really not good. You know, so just from the other side, as an author, you really only want to do it when it was clearly a marginal rejection. Uh, I'm uh, very enjoyable about uh, how to publish the English people, uh, English paper in, in 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 the Western world. I'm a written scholar from uh, Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. In our country, uh, we uh, published. Uh, the, 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 the paper's most important is, is there is a two things. Not only your, uh, your paper is very good, but also guanxi. Guanxi means social circle. If you have a guanxi, maybe uh, you can more than easily to publish it. I'm, 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 my question is, is the same as in your country or your, your world? So I'm not entirely sure I understood. So you, did, did you say that your social circle, is that, what you, is that the word you used? 
No, I, I didn't understand. Okay, please, can I ask you sorry. don't understand. Uh, I mean, if I, I'm familiar with you and, uh, yeah. and uh, they, the more... You're, you're more likely to get published. To. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to say. So a lot of people say that that's true. So in my experience, that isn't true. Um, but I can't say that that's not true everywhere. So clearly, the QJE tends to publish papers of a certain type. I don't think that's because they personally know the people, though it is probably partly because they're at Harvard, but um, that they work, but, but that's not necessarily just because you personally know them, it's because you're working in a certain field and in a certain way. I think that's more the point, that editors have prejudices, they have types of research they like, and you're more likely to publish the type of research that you like. It's a small profession, you're also more likely to know people that work in that area. They're more likely to be co-authors, they're more likely to... But, um, but most editors have very, are very scrupulous of not, like, I would not handle any paper that, of anyone I had ever worked with who was a co-author or any student or anyone that worked in any institution that I work in. So editors are very scrupulous about not, work, not, not dealing with papers that are that close to them. Um, the, in, the other, in the other sense that you could think that, so I think that most editors are more forgiving to young people than to senior people. So in the sense that if you're senior, you work with other senior people, I think that there is not a prejudice in that sense. I think editors tend to try to be nicer to younger people and give them the benefit of the doubt than older people. So I, I personally don't think that that's a really big issue in economics. I, I'm sure there's a little bit of it that goes on. Um, and you know, there are probably some big superstars that are more likely to get published in some ways, but I don't think that that's a, more often that would be through invited papers. So all journals have some kinds of invited papers, like at the EJ, at the annual conference, the people who give the keynote talks, their papers never get rejected. They're all, so we may edit them and we may ask them for revisions, but they're always gonna be published. Um, but we don't decide who to invite to, to, to give those lectures, so. Jobbing. Uh, just want to elaborate a little bit more uh, about it, uh, Macaulay's question. So you talked about uh, rejected being by failed journal and then submit to your paper with reference report. Just uh, have a scenario, for example, if a top failed journal rejected and then the referee report says something that we think, okay, would have mainly because we didn't write it clearly or now with revision we think we can deal with these questions very successfully. So they admit, uh, they recognize the contribution is very big, but it just didn't write it uh, clearly enough. So in this case, if we revise it and then we submit with the reference report a detailed response to this report, do you think it's feasible or possible to submit to EG, for example? It, it's possible, but less likely. So you'd have to have a very good reason for like, we wrote this paper and then the referee's reports led us to really think actually the contribution was much bigger than we originally thought, so we're aiming higher now. So you'd need to be really clear that that was the case. Um, so if you could do that, yeah, that's not, that's pretty unusual, but yeah, maybe, could be. Any more questions? Over there at the back, Job Chen. You got another one there, Chen. Um. Thank you for your presentation, it was really useful, good for us. <laughs> um, I just wondered if internet uh, had any effect on the hierarchy of the journals, because now I imagine like, if I got to publish anything, like in any journal, <laughs> and if it was on uh, like Google, most journals are like uh, published. I, I imagine most, I mean, now nowadays, it's a general typing something on like Google Scholar and it comes up on the results. It has citations, but it also, if you are interested in topic, you will check most of the topics and you would also read, even if it's, if it's, if it's if not cited, uh, if you match the criteria, you will take a look at it. So I, I wondered if uh, the internet, if changed anything about, you know, the hierarchy, uh, in or is it changing uh, in yeah. a way? So that's a Thank super you. good question. Thanks. So the journal industry is changing really very rapidly, both with the internet and with um, what's called open access. So probably you've all heard about open access that the funding bodies are now requiring in the UK that everyone publishes their work open access. 
Actually, in economics, that doesn't have that much impact because we already did that in economics. In economics, we already published working papers well beforehand. And so the journal, getting published in a journal is really like a kite mark. It's not about uh, accessibility of the paper. You can get papers beforehand. It's about validating that the paper is a, is a higher quality paper than other papers. And so it's still the case that in promotion decisions, it's based on publication, not on. So sometimes people cite Google Scholar cita number of citations, but that doesn't tend to be very influential. What, what's most influential is the, paper, is the journals you get published in. And the ranking of journals in economics changes incredibly slowly. So new journals come in. So it's only when new journals have been launched by other existing top journals, like the AEJ journals from the American Economic Review, that they can enter the market and be at all ranked near the top. Um, new journals come out all the time, but they don't move up the rankings. So, you know, I, I think actually in terms of the ranking and in terms of it, it has pretty little effect in economics. I think in other disciplines it's had much bigger effect. Yeah. Can I ask a related question to that? Just uh, we had questions if like knowing editors or uh, like editors, you know, the relationship between uh, people in the journal, like knowing, uh, knowing other people, knowing people who send the articles, like does it increase the likelihood of publishing that paper? So related to that question, you know, the bias of editors or uh, well, so that was the answer I gave to yeah. that. So, so look, I'm a super fair person, right? So you may be asking the wrong person here, but in my view, I go out of my way to be fair to young people. And of all the editors I know, like the, at the review and everything, people are super fair to young people in particular. I wasn't going to ask that. I was just wondering, like, if, even if we assumed if it happened, like imagine there's a really good article and it sometimes got published in a lower hierarchy and it went into the internet. Is there any possibility that it will emerge and you know that person will become somehow known uh, like even though that article wasn't published in the top uh, journal? Sure, people have won Nobel Prizes based on papers that were published in mid-ranking journals. I mean, it's journal, so journal publication is super influential for your promotion decision. Okay. But for the influence of your work, some papers that are published in mid-ranking journals are very influential. And so presenting your work and people finding it interesting is going to be as important in your long-run career, you know. So, one, but in terms of like getting promoted, being in